Okay, we are here with uh, the world-renowned Jared Taylor. Does race and IQ correlate in any way to crime statistics in your belief, based on facts that you've found? Well, crime, crime and IQ uh, have uh, an inverse correlation. That is to say, the lower the IQ, the greater the crime rate, no matter what race we're talking about. Right. Uh, low IQ white people are much more likely to commit crimes than high IQ white people. And so you have that relationship no matter what race of people you're talking about. In the case of blacks, because the average IQ is 85, that is to say a full standard deviation lower than the average IQ for, for whites, you just have that many more blacks who are in the more crime prone uh, area. Uh, but even if you control for IQ and you're comparing black people and white people with the same IQs, black people are still more inclined to commit crime. Uh, I think there's several reasons for this. One is that cri uh, IQ is not the only contributor to crime. Another is what's called a short time horizon. If you are unwilling to defer gratification, if you think, uh, well, I'm, I'm not going to take some chump change job and work hard to buy my sneakers, I'm going to smash the window and grab them now then that mentality, the inability to defer gratification, the disciplined approach of working hard now for some sort of reward in the future, uh, there too there seems to be uh, a racial difference between blacks and whites. Uh, at the same time, uh, crime, particularly violent crime, is correlated with the high levels of uh, blood testosterone, serum testosterone. Uh, blacks have higher levels of serum testosterone than whites, and so they have this sort of triple-fold, this three-fold combination of circumstances that make them more likely to commit crime, and especially violent crime. That is to say, higher average testosterone, lower IQ, and a lesser ability to defer gratification. And I would say that we can even statistically say and be factually correct when we say it's actually maybe four components that go into the uh, greater risk to being, you know, leading to a life of crime. And the fourth one would probably be the out of wedlock rate amongst black Americans. And, uh, you know, back in 1965 in the Lyndon B. Johnson era, it was only at about 22 percent today. It is at 72%, and I say this all the time, Barack Obama even said this, you know, the, le the left's favorite president, you are five times more likely to lead to a life of crime if you live in a fatherless home, and you are 20 times more likely to go to prison if you live in a fatherless home. You know the statistics that children who grow up with a fa out of father are five times more likely to live in poverty and commit crime. They're nine times more likely to drop out of school, 20 times more likely to end up in prison. What do you think well, that that has to do with IQ? Does, that, does the out of wedlock rate have anything to do with IQ or was it the welfare certainly. state? Well, uh, IQ, IQ is correlated or negatively correlated, if you will. The lower the IQ, the higher the incidence of all sorts of socially undesirable outcomes. And uh, an unwed motherhood is one of them. So is the unwed motherhood rate, is that uh, some kind of independent variable or is it a dependent variable? Is it likewise something that's caused by low IQ? These things all sort of conspire uh, together to work in a negative way for blacks and a particularly positive way, I might add, for Asians. But uh, for whites as well, it works in a positive way, certainly compared to blacks. So, yes, uh, but this is uh, obviously an environmental factor as well because if in 1965, 25% of black children were illegitimate, and now the figure is 70 or 72%. Something is changing. The genetics of blacks have not changed radically during that time period. So there's something about the culture, something about the environment that has changed and makes out of wedlock, out of wedlock birth much less of a social pariah phenomenon than it used to be. It's the same for whites now, you know. I think uh, currently the white out of wedlock uh, birth rate is something like uh, 30%, 30, 35%. So one yeah third of white children illegitimate as well. The rates for all races have been increasing. And I think there's no question that welfare has been part of that. If there is no such thing as welfare, if you're an unmarried woman and you get knocked up and you have a big belly and a child, 
wow, you are really in uh, in dire straits. You have to ask your family. Your family's going to be furious. Strangers are not going to help you. And right. people all knew that. People knew that the consequences of unwed motherhood for a woman were really very, very dire. And people were just very careful to avoid that. Now the stigma is gone. The financial consequences are gone. Well, the stigma is not completely gone. It's still the case that for middle class and upper middle class uh, women, very few of them uh, have out of wedlock pregnancies because uh, they understand that that's a very, very bad beginning, uh, not only for the child, but for them as well. You know, you can you can have a PhD, but if you're a single woman and all of a sudden you've got a child, your life has changed in a very unpleasant way. Right. And that actually kind of leads me into my next question. Do you believe that America should remain the majority white? Well, uh, I think that all people are generally more comfortable when they're around people like themselves. Uh, the idea that white people, who used to be a 90% majority in the United States, should welcome and celebrate uh, this process of immigration whereby we're being reduced to a minority, the idea that we're supposed to think that's great, is insane. No healthy people would welcome their own reduction to a minority status. And it would be impossible to trick the Japanese and the Mexicans, the Turks, into thinking uh, that some sort of process whereby uh, other people, unlike themselves, are going to come flowing in at, at such a rate that they'd be reduced to minority was a great thing. You just couldn't trick them into thinking that. Only white people uh, believe this sort of thing. So, yes, I'm very much opposed to that. Unfortunately, we are at a state now where... Uh, a white child, as soon as he or she is born, is already a minority. There are more non-white children being born. That's been the case since about 2013. A white child is an instant minority. And so this minority status, even if you stopped immigration tomorrow, this minority status is going to work its way up through uh, the various cohorts so that uh, uh, we are inevitably going to be a white minority country if nothing is done. To me, the only solution, if we are to maintain some kind of area or region of the United States where we are the unquestioned majority, there's going to be some kind of segmentation, some kind of balkanization of the United States. To me, that's the only hope. The idea of somehow taking, uh, you know, 100 million non-white people and sending them back home, I just don't think that's practical. In many cases, it's just not moral. The only hope we have for what would be considered an ethnostate is some portion of the United States, uh, not the whole thing. And, and so I've heard a lot of, I don't consider myself on the alt-right, but I've heard a lot of people on the alt-right suggest that giving incentives to white families to have more children, which I, to, to, I say to that, that that would be, there's no way that the majority of the population would ever go for that. And if it was up for a vote, there's no way that it would ever win because that would, you know, people would just look at that and just be like, well, no. What I would say is that, I think the, to me, I think welfare has a big part to do with a lot of these things that are happening. So, for instance, if you know, I came out to California, if I didn't have anyone to live with, if I didn't have anyone to help me out here as I, you know, started my life out here, uh, I would have just been went back home to Chicago and just struggled back there. And that's how I kind of see. You know, for instance, people who come over here from South America, they come over here for a better life. They come over here and they see that they can receive incentives, WIC, uh, SNAP, you know, all these different incentives from the federal government without being a citizen. And they see that, okay, yes, I'm leaving the majority of my family that I love and I really want to see again behind, but this is a better life. Now, if we were to take that away, if we were to, for instance, imp imp uh, you know, put credit checks for welfare, you know, very strict limitations on welfare and things of that nature, I believe that some people that are coming over here for those particular benefits would be like, okay, yeah, I'm struggling here too. So I might as well just go back home where, with my family that I love and I really miss and struggle with them and at least be with them. Not only would, would, do I believe it would fix the immigration problem, but it would also fix the out of wedlock rate amongst whites and amongst other races in America and and in turn reduce some amount of crime. What do you say to that? Oh, I certainly agree that uh, welfare is a perverse incentive. 
In effect, it says, okay, you 16-year-old girl, uh, if you get pregnant and there's no man around to help you, the state, the government, will pay for all of your needs. Uh, the government might even find you an apartment. The government will pay you money, keep you alive. And so all of the social opprobrium, all of the social disadvantages of this kind of reckless procreation are done away with by the government. Now, I do not believe <clears throat> that these policies were instituted uh, in the hope of encouraging this kind of behavior. I don't think so at all. I think most of these liberal programs were conceived of by people who thought they were just being nice to unfortunate folks. They just did not understand that if you reward perverse or irresponsible behavior, you're going to get more of it. Okay. Uh, that, that's just a, an iron law of nature. People are lazy. People are irresponsible. And if you take the punishment away from lazy, irresponsible behavior, then you're simply going to get more of it. But I, I, entirely, I entirely agree. All of that makes this uh, whole process of uh, the proliferation of the incompetence subsidized by taxpaying competence. The, 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 that's, uh, you can't keep on doing that forever. You can't keep taxing the high IQ people to support the increasing procreation of the low IQ people. Right. After a while, the system completely breaks down. And, as you say, the availability of these benefits encourages immigration, both legal and illegal. If you were to look at a study, a very interesting study by the Center for Immigration Studies here in Washington, D.C., you'd find that the welfare use rate by immigrants particularly Hispanic immigrants, is very, very high. It's, uh, it can be multiples of three, four, five, the, the white rate. So you have immigrants coming to this country and putting their snout in the public trough right as soon as they get here. If this sort of thing were better known, I think most, most uh, Native uh, Americans of whatever race would be hopping mad. Who agrees to the idea of some guy waltzing across our borders, whether legally or whether illegally or legally, and then going on public welfare, that this is an outrage. Most societies just simply don't permit it. And the fact that we do is working constantly to our own disadvantage. Right. I was, when I was younger and I married to my wife, who is, she's, she went through the process, we paid the money, we got her you know, legal. For a very short amount of time, I was on some, it was called, it's called WIC, right? Women's mm -hmm. Infants Children. It's like, almost right. like a food stamp program. This was when I was like right. 19 or so. I was very embarrassed about that. Mm, mm. Well, you should of, be. There's a lot of people, yeah. and I got off really fast. There's a lot of people out there that aren't embarrassed about these things. Well, this, is, this is part of the mentality, the idea that people have. If you can get away with it, you deserve it. Uh, we should all be embarrassed if we are sucking on the public teat. In effect, we are... Uh, the government is the intermediary, but we are taking money from our neighbors. We are spongers. We are moochers when right. we are living on government handouts. But the idea now is, uh, oh, the government is doing all these wonderful things. And as a matter of fact, there is a campaign. There are constant campaigns, Spanish language campaigns, to encourage uh, non -well -well, Spanish speaking people to take advantage of whatever benefits they qualify for. The idea is uh, even if they have scruples about it, and some of them do, some Mexicans come to this country and I'm sure they think, well, we got no right to go on the public dole like this. Right. But these campaigns, in effect, say, sure, you qualify, you know, take the money, take the money. You'd be a fool not to. And when everybody around you is taking the free money, you begin feeling like a fool not to, no matter what sort of initial scruples you might have about it exactly and and you know a lot of things going back to the whole race and IQ thing uh, whenever I explain these things to people like I've, I've de debated people a lot of people that watch our channel know that we go out and we do live streams we talk to college students we also mm -hmm. do videos you know commentary videos I've talked to a lot of college students and uh, when I debate people about this whole white privilege myth right so I believe it's it's ridiculous to say you know these 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 students they come up to me and they say oh well Blacks are overwhelmingly mass incarcerated. Uh, blacks are, are more likely to end up in prison. And I tell, and I, when I explain these two things to them, like, okay, listen, this is the reason why they're, you know, only 6% of our population, black males aged 18 through 35, commit almost 50% of the entire country's crimes. These are the statistics here. I mean, th this, is, this is the reason why people are mass incarcerated, 72% out, out of wedlock rate. There's a reason why you don't see Asians looting in the streets whenever there's a hurricane. There's a reason why you don't see Asians 
in, a, in, a, in cases of home break-ins. You don't see a lot of Asians doing that. There's a reason for that, and, it's, and it's, it has a lot to do with genetics. Oh, you're, you know, the, the next thing that I hear is either Nazi, white supremacist, or racist out of their mouths. Right. How do we make it mainstream for people to know these, these, these things? That is why you had your YouTube video and I had uh, uh, my YouTube video as well to try to explain the facts of race and IQ as convincingly and as unemotionally and in terms of the data as possible. And this is something that it's essential that white people understand because if you don't accept the absolutely overwhelming evidence for the view that there's a genetic contribution to racial differences in IQ, then you're left with only one other explanation as to why blacks are more likely to be poor, have out of wedlock children, be in jail, et cetera, et cetera, and all these other signs of social dysfunction. And that one explanation is white wickedness, either past, slavery, lynching, Jim Crow, or the present, institutional right. racism, white privilege, all of this mumbo jumbo. It is absolutely essential for whites to have these facts put before the public and understood. Otherwise, we carry around this utterly unfair burden of responsibility and guilt for something that is not our fault, not our fault at all. Now, why is it whites are so resistant to an explanation that in effect absolves them of responsibility for something which they are not guilty. This is a very deep psychological problem white people have. As one of my friends says, uh, white people love to feel good about being white by feeling bad about being white. The right. worse you feel about being white, the more virtuous you think you are. How we got into this twisted state of mind, that's a long story and I'm not sure there's a good explanation for it. Whites have a kind of a, uh, a pathological streak of altruism to them. We want to be responsible for all of the failures of everybody else. We want to be responsible for the planet. We want to be responsible for all the species that are uh, about to go extinct. Uh, right. We want to be responsible for uh, the, the atmosphere. White people have this, uh, uh, in, many time, in many cases, a very laudable sense of, of responsibility towards those who may be weaker, those for who do not have the same level of power. And that works well if we're talking about this impulse within the white tribe. When this impulse to altruism gets exploited by others and we start working against our own racial interests, that's when it goes completely haywire. But it is true. Whites, by and large, if you present to them the, the evidence for the view that Asians are gen genetically smarter than they are, many of them will say, eh, yeah, yeah, I guess that's true. Yeah, if I, you know, you, you in college, you know, you'd walk into a math class and it was full of Asians, you know, wow, uh, I'm just not going to compete. I'll take a different math class. They sort of understand that. But if you say the very same evidence shows that blacks on average are less intelligent than white people for genetic reasons. They, oh, my gosh, we can't believe that. That's horrible. I don't know. I don't know where this irrational comes from. Yeah, exactly. Right. When you when you explain it like that in terms, yeah, you know, there's other races that are smarter smarter than white people's, and yeah, they're willing right. to accept that. But because yeah. of this whole generation that was indoctrinated by this Marxist lens, you know, basically taught to look through this Marxist lens that they're, they're you know, this postmodernism. Uh, this is the reason why we see this rise in SJWs, this rise in feminists with horn rimmed glasses and pink hair. Everyone is so reluctant to speak about these things because they have been trained not to. Yes, there is uh, a very thorough brainwashing that goes yep. into being an American today, especially young people. And uh, I used to be annoyed by the really mean-spirited and quite wild denunciations of non-whites and sometimes of Jews that you find on the internet by people who just use the most, the crudest sorts of expressions. And I think all of that is very damaging to our cause. If you want to persuade somebody that you're right, you don't run around saying genuinely hateful things. There are some hateful things that are sometimes said. But I'm a little bit more understanding of that when I think of the fact that so many young white people today, right from kindergarten on, they've been told, you guys are really the cancer of human history. Yes. It may not, they may not be put that in so many words, but you people, people who look like you, your ancestors, you are responsible for everything that has ever gone wrong anywhere, anytime in the world for people who don't look like you. Yes. And you get told this over and over and over and over again, and once you realize that this is a bunch of baloney, it's 
easy to be absolutely hopping mad. Yes. But when you are hopping mad, uh, you are not going to be saying very persuasive things. Anybody who is hopping mad is somebody that anyone who is inclined to disagree with you is going to say, I can ignore everything this guy's saying. He's unhinged. And so we should do our best to avoid any of that kind of vituperation. But I, I certainly understand what causes it. Yeah, and that, and that can go into the whole rise of alt-right conversation. Uh, you know, that's the reason why we see this rise in, in this alt-right movement. That's the reason why we saw 2,000 people, I say it's 2,000 march with torches in Charlottesville. I understand their anger. It, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think, I don't necessarily agree with the way that these kids are going about doing some of these things, but I can understand that they actually grew up, we have to think about this, these kids grew up under knowing only Barack Obama as their president. And they were told for that entire time throughout grammar school and high school, that they were the cancer to society, that white right. people were bad, were colonialists. And this is one of the Asian people, actually, that I was talking to at one of these things in Washington, D.C., who, who was talking about white privilege and how white people benefited from slavery. And I asked him, I said, do you have an inheritance? And I asked him calmly, and he said, yes, I do. And I said, how far does your inheritance go back? He said, one generation. I said, exactly. So your parents decided that they wanted to work harder than their grandparents who were poor to give you an inheritance. Did that come from slavery? No, it did not. What is astonishing is not that blacks will make claims of that kind. Uh, people will make all sorts of preposterous claims if they think that it will benefit them. Right. What is astonishing is that white people fall for this. White people will agree yeah. that, that black people somehow created all the wealth of America and that we're benefiting from it. Well, wait, if black people are so astonishingly productive, why is Africa a mess? Why is Haiti a terrible mess? Right. It's full of all these super productive black people. The black people who made the wealth of America, couldn't they make the wealth of Haiti too? Right. No, none of this makes any sense. And the, also the very idea of white privilege. Uh, Iceland, Iceland is still almost exclusively white. Now, presumably there's no white privilege in Iceland, right? But if you shipped in, oh, a good half a million Somalis, all of a sudden, would the people of Iceland be so much better off because suddenly they have white privilege? No, Iceland would suffer terribly because of the arrival of half a million Somalis. It would be a miserable ad addition to that country and devastated. And yet, only by the presence of non-whites could they conceivably have white privilege. So by the definition of white privilege, they'd be better off if they had this devastating I infusion to their population. We, I mean, who in America thinks that uh, white people would be much worse off if there were no non-whites here. If white privilege depends on the presence of non-whites, then if all non-whites were to disappear, would we suddenly be cast into this miserable state of not having white privilege? None of this, none of right. this makes any sense. It doesn't make sense. And what about Asian privilege? Because I'm pretty sure the recent statistics that I've seen in wealth in America, Asian Americans who have only been here for the past decade own a pretty good majority of the wealth. But yes, in terms of per capita income, household income, likelihood to be admitted to an Ivy League university, also crime rates, uh, sexually transmi right. transmitted disease rates, in all, by every measure of social uh, success, uh, Asians are doing better than whites. Right. And so, yes, your, your question is, okay, if whites are benefiting, if whites got what they have from white privilege, how come Asians have what they have? Is there some sort of unfair Asian privilege? But no, people don't think consistently in these terms. They would say, oh, Asians work harder. Asians are smart. Asians have a good culture. But if whites, if whites are doing well, do we, do we work hard? Do we have a good culture? No, it's privilege. It's white privilege, now, right? Yes, all of this stuff is completely incoherent. And that's why it's so easy to argue against these people who take these preposterous positions because they're illogical, they make no sense, they have no historical grounding. And so I almost feel unfair when I'm debating some of these people because we're right and they're wrong. Right. And I meant, uh, yeah, I meant portion of the wealth. Asians own a good yes. portion of the wealth in the United right. States. Uh, as I like to say, the best red pill is reality. Uh, you just look around and you see that the facts on the ground simply do not match 
the explanations that we are constantly being force fed. So anybody with two functioning eyes in his head realizes that diversity is not a strength, for example. Diversity is a source of enormous conflict. That's an obvious lie. Anybody with two functioning eyes in his head recognizes that blacks and whites do not behave in the same way, and that if there are more blacks in jail on a proportionate basis than whites, it's probably because they commit more crime, not because some bigoted police force is out there rounding up innocent black people and throwing them into jail. None of this stuff makes sense. Anybody who's gone to an integrated high school knows that black and white behavior is not by any means identical, and that if black people are more likely to be suspended, it's because they commit more suspendable offenses, not because some bunch of school administrators are culturally blind and are bigoted and are unfairly punishing blacks who don't deserve to be punished. There are so many obvious inconsistencies and stupidities that are part of the mainstream narrative that more and more people of absolutely average IQ are beginning to realize just what a bunch of baloney it is. And all of this is why the so-called alt-right, uh, I think of it more as sort of a racial dissident movement, uh, that is why people who see the truth are increasing in number and will continue to increase in number because the truth is so obvious compared to the prevailing lies. Right. I mean, I don't I particularly, I don't, I never ha and never will just hate or despise anyone because of the color of their skin. I will never will just shy away from associating from someone just because of the color of their skin. But when I talk about these things, people think that I do. You know, when I, when I talk about, uh, you know, the, you brought up a great point, the cops killing everyone's in this Black Lives Matter movement and cops are all racist and things of that nature. When you look at the actual numbers, and I understand there's a proportionality argument to this, but when you look at the other actual numbers, in 2015, there was 900 or so people killed by police. 500 of those were white. So if the cops were truly a racist outfit, if the cops were all truly racist, that number would be closer to zero. I mean, in all actuality, if you want to think of it with a commonsensical type of approach, right? And not only did that, but again, we can start talking about the, the whole where the blacks are more likely to commit crimes. I heard this one lady who, who said that, you know, black people in America don't use drugs at a higher rate than white people, which is true, but they're more likely to be sent to prison for those drug offense. And I went to PolitiFact and I actually fact-checked her in this video here it says through these studies that they're more likely to be locked up for the drug offenses because they're more likely to have previous criminal records. This is the reason for this. Well, and, well, you know, a, no couple, a, couple, for that. a couple of points to be made here. Where do we get the idea that black people are no more likely than white people to take drugs? We get that from self reports. If right. you ask black people and white people, how often do you take drugs? You get similar answers. However, if you test those answers against actual drug drug tests, you can uh, detect uh, you can detect drugs in urine. You can detect drugs in hair. You will find that blacks are far more likely to lie about this. Five, six times, sometimes even more likely to lie when you have these controlled tests. I don't believe the self reports. I think that blacks probably are more likely to take drugs than whites. There's another aspect of this as well. You are charged with drug possession if you're picked up from some other crime. And if blacks, compared to whites, and as they are, are 12 to 15 times more likely to be arrested for robbery. When you're arrested for robbery and you have a reefer in your pocket, you're likewise going to be acute. You're going to be picked up for drug possession as well as for robbery. So that goes into the statistics as well. I do not think that the problem here is any kind of biased police action. You have a nine times greater likelihood, if you are a black, of being arrested for drug use in the District of Columbia than a white guy. Is this because the District of Columbia, which is a police force that is run by blacks, has a majority of blacks, are they running around in some sort of biased, unfair way, picking on black people? Very unlikely. Very unlikely. So because first of, of all, previous criminal record. 
Right. Well, it's not just that. I think that black drug, drug use is considerably higher than white drug use. I think that blacks are simply more likely to lie. And this is brought out by, as I say, these independent tests in which you have populations in which there are urine tests or hair follicle tests that prove that black people are more likely to lie. So you're saying that these are based on self-reports. But even if yes. they weren't, even if they weren't right. based on self-reports, let's just say we did a drug test on every single American in the world and, and whites and blacks are the same at drug use level. Wouldn't that debunk the fact that everyone tries to say that the white man is throwing drugs into the black community? Wouldn't that debunk the fact? Because if you're saying that whites use drugs the same amount as blacks do, that debunks your whole your whole stance right there where you're saying the white man's trying to hold the black community down by throwing drugs into their community. Well, that's right. I hadn't thought about that. Uh, right. This this argument hasn't been made in some, for some time, but the idea that the CIA was somehow bringing right. drugs, not just drugs, guns too, you know. Guns the too, CIA yeah, was bringing pallets of guns, right. Guns and drugs into the black community. Oh boy. What, what I mean, that is so crazy and preposterous that not even the wildest blacks make that claim anymore. Right, and, you know, I'm not one to ever back up the CIA on anything, but, you know, I mean, just some of these things, some of these conspiracies, but uh, mm. anyway, last no. question. How mm -hmm. do you think Trump is doing, and did you vote for Trump? Oh, I certainly voted for Trump. Okay. I even recorded uh, robocalls for Trump uh, during the New Hampshire primary. Uh, <sighs> Donald Trump is a very erratic and, I think, unstable guy. I don't think that he has ever thought systematically and deeply about anything uh, except for perhaps New York City real estate. I don't think he has a sophisticated understanding of race or the demographic future of the United States. I think he has generally good instincts. And when he acts on these instincts, then he's, he's fine. But uh, he's been very inconsistent since his election. During the campaign, he promised that his first day in office, he was going to rescind DACA. He was going to send all these illegals home. Well, he didn't do that, and now he is actually talking as though he wants to wants to have Congress pass a law that makes sure that these people who were young and brought to the United States illegally by their illegal immigrant parents have some sort of path to legality and maybe even to citizenship. I'm very disappointed in that. Uh, right. When he has uh, when he was negotiating the budget, he had several opportunities to push hard to build a wall. Right. Uh, he hasn't pushed as hard as he could have. But compared to the alternative we would have had with Hillary Clinton, he gets an A++++++. Plus, 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 plus. Uh, and anything uh, compared to her probably would have been better. And again, as I say, he has got generally healthy instincts. I think he is an American nationalist. He's not a person who thinks in terms of race. But he has tumbled to the fact that certain people assimilate better to the United States than others, and that, that uh, Muslims, for example, even those who aren't terrorists, uh, they want they have all these special food uh, dietary restrictions. They want to stop the assembly line and pray five times a day. You know, they don't want to eat uh, during the daytime during Ramadan. They want to slit the throat of a lamb uh, for an El Aid uh, in their bathtub, perhaps. So they, they've got all these odd habits that, that don't necessarily make them uh, the best neighbors. He understands this sort of thing instinctually. And so... Uh, he is he is a guy who understands that there are terrible problems. For example, if people waltz across the border illegally and go on welfare, he has this sort of visceral sense that that's not right. If people come in illegally, that's not right. So right. in that respect, he's a very he's a very welcome and healthy change compared to the standard political class in the United States. Plus, he understands the crime that comes along with it. And actually, I have the statistics right here. According to the Let's just go one state real quick and then see if we have time. Uh, according to the Texas Department of Public Safety, this is a .gov website, from 2011 to 2016, there was over 600,000 crimes by illegal aliens. 3,000 of those were murder. So mm. just in one state in five years, there's been over 600,000 crimes by illegal aliens. 3,000 were murder. The lefties will often say that uh, immigrants, legal or otherwise, don't commit crime at any higher rates than natives. Uh, I don't think that that's true, but I don't think the disparity is as great as those statistics would I mean, have suggested. Right but parts, but no, really in, any, in any case, in any case right. if we had an immigration policy that working properly, we would not have any immigrants that committed any crimes. I mean, we get to choose. Right. Why should we? Why should we let 
anybody who's likely to commit a crime in the country. This is just nuts, completely nuts. And the idea that even if it were true that they don't commit crimes at any higher rates than the natives, we shouldn't have any of them if they're going to commit a crime. Frankly, I think we should be selecting uh, immigrants for all sorts of reasons, one of which would be one of criterion would be white people. Uh, I'd like all immigrants to be rich, white, and good-looking. Uh, what's wrong with that? But um, that, of course, is considered anathema by contemporary standards. Right. Well, thank, thanks again for joining us. Uh, Jared Taylor, talk to you soon.